afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm not sure uh, who is here and who is not here, but uh, let me start this uh, process. So my name is Guillaume Roger. I'm an associate professor of economics um, in the business school at um, Monash University. And I welcome you all to join us for uh, the first seminar of a slightly ad hoc series of talks uh, that are co-sponsored by the Monash Energy Institute and the Australian Electricity Market Initiative. So clearly the topic is going to be electricity. Uh, this webinar is going to run for approximately an hour. We welcome questions pretty much at any time. Um, the seminar is recorded. So for those people who prefer to not be part of this, uh, uh, there are alternatives. Um, and the recordings will be posted um, on the Monash University uh, Energy Institute web, web page uh, after some post-production. I'd like now to acknowledge country. Uh, I'd like to recognize that we're meeting on the traditional lands of a cooling nation. And I pay my respects for today, elders past, present, and emerging. And I express a warm welcome for any of them who may be joining us today. Um, our speaker today is uh, Gordon Le Leslie. Gordon is a lecturer at Monash University in economics. Um, he's a reasonably recent uh, PhD graduate, he graduated two or three years ago, I think, from Stanford University in the US. Uh, and he's a rising star in our department. Um, I will let him introduce the title and topic. Um, and uh, again, I want to welcome all of you to this talk. The next talk in this series will be next week by Frank Wallach from Stanford University. Uh, details um, should be in your inbox already, if they're not, uh, please search the Monash uh, University uh, website. Thanks very much. Gordon, over to you. Well, thank you, Guillaume, and, and thank you, uh, everyone who's attending. Um, today I'm presenting a, a recent working paper that I've um, completed with Guillaume, who you've just met, and uh, our wonderful postdoc, Armin uh, Um identifying consumption profiles and implicit cross-subsidies under fixed-rate electricity tariffs. So best to just jump in. Um, uh, so, um, hot retail and wholesale pricing of utility services. Traditionally, we know that uh, the bill we get as end users uh, of electricity usually has some sort of connection fee, which is generally expressed in dollars per day, and a usage fee, which is dollars or cents per kilowatt hour. So we face generally a flat price for every kilowatt hour we, uh, we, we, we consume. Um, but the underlying wholesale costs, uh, basically procuring these kilowatt hours, are time varying. Uh, and, and so some customers are going to be using energy at times of day when wholesale prices are relatively cheap. Other consumers will use energy when wholesale prices are rather expensive. But at the end of the day, we pay a flat, a flat rate uh, regardless of when we, we consume uh, our, our energy. And so therefore, if you're going to have fixed rate retail pricing, ex post customers will either be net funders or net beneficiaries from an implicit cross subsidy. Um, and I guess a uh, imperfect analogy is if, if you have a pool of, uh, you know, um, automobile or, uh, owners who, who insure their cars, some crash their cars and some don't. Okay, and so after the fact, those that say have accidents uh, are benefiting uh, from this insurance and those who don't ended up funding it. Um, so in, in an ex post sense, that's kind of what, what, what's going on with, with electricity in, in, in the context I'm thinking about it. And so in this paper, we're asking, you know, who cross subsidizes whom and to what extent? So basically who's consuming energy when it's really expensive and who's consuming it when it's relatively cheap. Um, and the motivation is, to better understand the distributional consequences of more cost reflective pricing, um, which the motivation of that is that having, having more cost reflective pricing can improve economic efficiency. And in the context of electricity, it's becoming, uh, in many cases it is, it is technologically feasible uh, to do so. So um, I'm just gonna flesh out this sort of motivation in a couple of slides before jumping into the analysis. So um, what I've got here, I'm not sure if my, I'm sure you can see my mouse, tracking uh, the lines on this chart. Um, on the x-axis, we've got the hour of day. Um, so midnight, midday, midnight. And on the y-axis, we've got the uh, average wholesale electricity price in Victoria in 2018. 
And so what you can kind of see is that overnight, you know, bottoming out at about 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., uh, electric wholesale electricity prices are really low. Uh, then on average, they rise up at a morning peak of around 7, 8, 9 uh, a.m. Uh, before wholesale electricity prices fall away in the middle of the day. And, and many people in this audience will be familiar with the cause of this. We've obviously got a lot of uh, solar penetration now in Victoria, which, which push it down with pressure on wholesale prices when the sun's shining in the middle of the day uh, before kind of rising on average to a, uh, to, to, to a peak um, at around 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, in, in the afternoon or early evening. And so this black dashed line is the yearly weighted average wholesale price. And if you were to think of a world where a utility uh, just had perfect um, uh, cost recovery um, of, of all energy prices, this would be say some socialized price. So users of energy at this sort of uh, end of day or you know, demand peak, there is, is you know, the underlying cost of the energy they use is quite high, but this socialized price is, is, is lower than it. And, and, and people who use energy say overnight or in the middle of the day, they're using energy that's relatively cheap to procure, but if they were paying a socialized price, they'd be paying above that. So you could kind of think that uh, users that concentrate their energy overnight or in the middle of the day cross subsidize users who sort of use a lot more energy towards the end of the day. Um, let me just see. So, um, so to kind of zoom out a little bit more here, this is the equivalent figure, but breaking down by the non-summer and the summer months of the year. And we kind of see that we see this similar kind of shape in, in, in the non-summer months with, with this sort of cross subsidization pattern, which I just described. Um, but in particular in summer, you sort of see average wholesale prices are particularly high uh, in that sort of late afternoon, early evening um, relative to this kind of um, weighted average price over the year. So why are we talking about cost reflective pricing? Um, the relevance seems to be ever increasing for two reasons. One, we've got metering upgrades. So it's now possible to monitor end user consumption of, of, of electrical energy at a high frequency. Uh, and therefore you can vary retail prices at a high frequency. You can kind of think back in the day when you had your meter man or, or meter maid, whatever the right, right term is, um, uh, they would check your meter, come back a month or two later, check your meter. And all you can see is how much somebody's consumed over that interval. Um, so you wouldn't be able to sort of say, well, wholesale prices were really high at 4 p.m. on February 5. Um, and so we're going to charge you based on that because we don't actually know whether you consumed uh, how much energy you used in, in, in that interval. But now with sort of so-called smart meters, um, we see um, half hour uh, resolution uh, of, of, of energy use. Um, second kind of key point is we're seeing increased variation in wholesale procurement costs or wholesale prices, basically, both the predictable and the idiosyncratic components. And why? Well, we're seeing big changes in the electricity supply. Obviously, we've got huge uh, renewable penetration going in. And so when the sun's shining and the wind's blowing, uh, it tends to really push prices down, all else being equal. Uh, and when that stops, you know, prices will, will, will quickly uh, rise up again. Uh, but we're also seeing changes in electricity demand. We're seeing much more, uh, many more periods of extreme and, and prolonged weather events, uh, pardon me. But we're also seeing that a lot more households say have air conditioning. And so this is meaning that our, our kind of peak demands can really get peak, uh, even more peaky, so to speak. Um, and so what this kind of says is that the economic value of flexible demand for electricity is growing. Um, you know, it, 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 in the past, perhaps there wasn't a heck of a lot of value in terms of um, uh, avoided procurement, uh, wholesale procurement costs of, um, you know, uh, consuming energy at midday instead of 6 p.m. But now if there's an abundance of kind of solar in the system in, um, at, at midday and, and, and none at six o'clock and it's really hot and everyone's using their, their AC, if you're able to kind of shift your, your, your usage uh, to say a different time of day, that would um, lower total system costs. And so how are we gonna achieve this? Well, if you are to ch achieve it, um, uh, incentivizing, uh, demand flexibility is going to require more cost reflective pricing. 
Um, and so what we're kind of getting at is, well, what would be the distributional consequences from having more cost-reflective, say, real-time pricing? Um, so, so let's, um, uh, let's jump to the preview of what we do in our results, and then I'll get into the analysis. So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to estimate average wholesale procurement costs for Victorian households in 2018. And so we're going to have substation level uh, load data, and we're going to kind of disaggregate that um, by the housing and demographic characteristics of the area um, to, to, to kind of see who, what groups uh, consume energy when, and, and we kind of have two main findings I'll highlight. Um, the first is that households in areas with, well, three characteristics stand out, low house prices, high levels of renters and more elderly residents appear to be the net funders of any of a cross subsidy from flat rate pricing. So uh, to, to kind of give, give, give some numbers to this, or, we estimate that average wholesale procurement costs in high rental neighbourhoods is about 9.9 .9 cents per kilowatt hour, which is about 11% less than the equivalent households in the equivalent neighbourhood, except that it has more owner occupiers, you know, is it, it less rental um, properties. And, and, and so um, the second main finding is that the magnitude of these cross subsidies has been increasing quite a lot in recent years coincident with solar penetration, which is basically um, pushing down prices in the middle of the day and pushing up prices at the end of the day. And so uh, that, that means that there's kind of a, uh, more kind of cross subsidies entailed by flat rate pricing. And so while uh, what, what these results do, and they, they raise the possibility that more cost reflective electricity pricing could on average, and I'll, we'll definitely flesh this out in the discussion, I'm not saying, uh, will do it for everybody, but on average benefit more vulnerable segments of the population. And, and, and I guess the idea behind all this is that the segments of the population that have a higher weight of energy consumption in the middle of the day and overnight relative to that kind of early evening peak um, are, are the ones who would better benefit from more cost reflective pricing. Second part of this preview, we're going to see uh, quite a few figures of this nature. Um, and so I'll just give an outline so you can kind of see what we're doing here. Um, here we're, we're going to, uh, we estimate uh, electricity consumption profiles by certain neighbourhood characteristics. This is by neighbourhood rental rates. And so this black line here is what we estimate is how much uh, the average household consumes in a neighbourhood with medium neighborhood rental rates and we'll define that later um, and so you can kind of see not so much overnight uh, more at the morning peak a slight dip in the middle of the day and then more as you get towards the early evening uh, before dropping away what we we do is we kind of say we, we compare this to to similar kind of uh, households but in areas with uh, more more renters which is the blue line or and less renters which is the red line and, and so first thing you see is on average, uh, households in high rental areas consume more than low uh, rental areas, which uh, supports what uh, we've seen in some of the energy efficiency literature that owner occupiers are more likely to install energy efficient appliances, perhaps have better insulation for their homes, so on and so forth, um, than, than renters. So th this is kind of just something that is more of a intermediate result of our analysis, but um, just to give you a taste of the exercise we'll be performing, but really the subtle point, which is the point of our paper, is the relative difference between the amount of consumption at the peak to the trough, or to the middle of the day, I should say, consumption. So for instance, for this red line, um, you kind of see that for this is the houses in high owner occupier areas, if on average they're consuming uh, you know, 0.3 kilowatts, um, or they have a load of 0.3 kilowatts in the middle of the day, it kind of doubles by the end of the day. So that's quite a high ratio but that ratio is much smaller for these uh, rental properties. And so the average wholesale procurement cost per kilowatt hour is gonna be higher for, for, for this group relative to the, to, to the high rental group. Um, so, so I'll give a quick roadmap. We've just done the introduction. I'm gonna to briefly touch on the literature, the data and setting uh, before getting into our methodology and results for both the demand profiles and the wholesale spot procurement costs. 
and we'll leave this leave it with quite an open ended uh, uh, discussion, which which of course everybody's willing to uh, welcome to participate in. And then I see that there are some questions and answers going up. Please feel free to ask them as we go. Raise your hand. Guillaume seems to be addressing those, and, and I'm sure he'll yell out to me when he when when, when I um. Uh, should address something to the group. So briefly, the selected literature, our main contribution is to this sort of uh, distributional impacts from electricity tariff structures literature. So there's been work, this is not exhaustive, but there's been work, of course, on network tariffs. Um, many of you may be familiar with, with, with uh, uh, Paul Simsauer's work there. Um, also with regard to net metering and clean energy subsidies, but there actually hasn't been a ton on on this idea of energy pricing, that, that you know wholesale prices are cheap at some times a day, expensive at others, and so that's where we kind of step in, uh, where we kind of identify these cross subsidies from energy with reference to the wholesale spot procurement costs. There are also many studies on elect empirical studies on electricity use. Again, a selection here. What I want to emphasize, what we're doing differently, is at least what we're aware of of the studies that look at demographic data, linking demographics to energy use, it's often looking at energy use over a year or something like that, or a self-reported kind of survey um, response to how much energy you use. I'm not so familiar with, with anybody who's, who's really linking that to times of use. And so that's kind of a requirement to get into this uh, cross-subsidy question that we're looking at. And, and finally, we don't necessarily have to make a, a big contribution to, to the understanding of welfare economics of fixed rate and real-time electricity pricing, but certainly a literature which motivates our topic and we lean heavily on in, in the discussion. So let's just jump into the data and setting. So first off, we're studying Victoria in 2018, and I just want to emphasize the, the, the time period here. Um, uh, you know, this is pre-COVID. So, you know, when the, when the sun was shining and the birds were chirping and I don't know, kids were playing with the sprinklers out the front and sunny boys were 50 cents at the milk bar. Um, well, actually, probably not that, but, but, but just it is important for context. This is before the big work from home boom, um, but it is not before the renewable penetration. So nine to five workers, that sort of stuff still happened quite a lot um, more than it certainly is today. And wholesale prices tended to be cheaper in the middle of the day. Um, in terms of the climate, uh, again, locals will know we've got a summer price peak in the wholesale markets, but in Victoria, the usage peaks are in winter and summer, and again, particularly in the early evening. And, and finally, what's, what's quite important, of course, is how do we price uh, electricity in the retail markets here? It's contestable, but uh, a couple of things to note, fixed price plans dominate. Um, uh, I, it looks like when I looked at some, some industry statistic, it looks like about 90% of plans are fixed price. There was no real time pricing in 2018. And if there was any, it was, it was negligible. Um, and customers on average switch their retailer every four to seven years. Um, and so I just want to reiterate the exercise in our paper is going to be recovering the average wholesale procurement costs for a group of households. And you can kind of relate these findings to cross subsidies uh, given the prevalence of fixed price plans in our, um, in our, uh, you know, in Victoria over this time. Excuse me. Okay. So the data, um, the raw data is all publicly available, which we use. So we use half hourly substation level load data, which is provided by the five uh, DNSPs, distribution network service providers, uh, across Victoria. I'll just refer for interested people to our paper um, where you can see the links if you're, if you're interested in, in, in obtaining that. Um, why isn't this going? There we are. Um, electricity price data, it's half hourly uh, as well. And we use, of course, the Victorian price and that's sourced from AEMO. And finally, in terms of housing, demographics and climate data, well, the housing and demographics it all comes from the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics. It's postcode level or, or, or suburb, suburb level, one of the two. I, I can't quite recall. Um, but And weather station level from the Bureau of Meteorology. And so what we do is we kind of convert this into a, uh, into a final data set uh, and organise it into a, a panel data set, which is um, uh, sort of substation uh, 
S is the panel variable and half hour T is, um, is the time variable. And so the, the key kind of two dependent variables we'll be using throughout the, the analysis. The first is electricity use, which is measured at the substation. So that's going to be known by Q uh, at, at substation S at time at half hour T. Uh, and then we're also going to use this wholesale procurement cost, which we're going to denote by PC for procurement cost at substation S time T, which um, is just simply the, the, the load multiplied by the spot price. I actually think I've been a bit lazy here because um, we, we definitely dot our I's and cross our T's in the paper, um, but, but um, uh, load is in megawatts and, 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 and of course procurement costs, we need to convert this to megawatt hours. So it's probably divided by two in there. Um, so, so that's sort of our, our electricity data. And then what we do is we map the postcode and weather stations, uh, which, which contain our demographic and, and, and weather information uh, to the closest substation. And again, I'll, I'll refer interested re, uh, attendees to the paper there uh, for the exact method, but it's, it's just basically closest point. Um, and so from that, the key variables are the number of households, the number of businesses. So um, basically we're going to be assuming that the number of households in the, in the postcode surrounding uh, each substation are the number connecting to that substation. So that's, that's the approximation we're, we're, we're making. And then for Z, uh, our, our vector Z, that's going to contain housing demographic and climate characteristics. Um, so in terms of the coverage we get, the data is pretty good, but it's not uh, complete. There is some missing, uh, some data quality issues regarding uh, the electricity and the, and the housing data. Um, but overall, we cover about 80 to 90% of the population in Victoria. So it's very much representative. Um, so over 5 million people and 1.7 million uh, dwellings and, and, and about 50,000 businesses, we assume are connecting to the 157 substations that make our sample. So I'd now just get into the methodology and, uh, and present the results. Um, and, and, and let's see. So, um, so the, the, the statistical model we're going to be doing to back out these electricity use profiles we're basically going to estimate 48 models uh, indexed by H. So one for every half hour of the day. And so you can kind of think what we're going to do is we see substation kilowatts you know, load uh, for every half hour of day, and we're going to model it as a function of the number of households and the number of businesses. And so under some, 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 some assumptions as to um, uh, <clears throat> as to the error term here being, being uh, independent to the, to the amounts of um, houses and businesses, these betas and this gamma, it's going to reflect the average electricity use for, uh, for, for the households in our sample and for the businesses in our sample. And so this is the base model. We'll introduce um, uh, kind of demographics in the next um, version of the model. And in some ways, the proof's in the pudding here as to how this um, goes in describing behaviour or electricity use. So each dot here is one of those 48 models uh, and, and it's reporting the coefficients from those models. And so where, what we back out for business profiles looks like on average, businesses have relatively flat use overnight and then they ramp up and start using energy throughout the middle of the day uh, before falling away again and going out. So it has very, it looks like a very nine to five style profile dominates on average for businesses. Um, uh, and, and then, so, so, so that's the kind of average business profile. For the household profile, it looks more like the whole of the system. It's dominating and it, it sort of has that duck curve, which many people are familiar with, where overnight there's little use, a bit of a morning peak uh, in the daytime use falls away. And of course, that could be behind the meter generation. That could be due to solar generation. It could also be... Um, uh, it could also be um, just people aren't home if they're working nine to five before quite a steep increase up until the evening peak on average. Um, so, so, so this is sort of the base profile of which we can get out. I'm just going to address two questions in the chat. We're going to, I'll go through the demographic variables in, in, in a moment, uh, Sanjitha, and, and to Tim Ryan. Um, yes, we are just focusing on energy in this, in this, uh, piece we're not, and you're dead right, 
Uh, DNSP tariffs or network tariffs are, are a whole other kettle of fish, which of course also have uh, distributional uh, impacts. But no, we, we, we're narrowing the scope here to, to what we, 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 we can do. So, um, you know, and I'd refer you to um, Simsales's 2014 paper who, who, who looks at um, network tariffs. So, um, so now I'm going to expand this, these, this profiles to our full statistical model that's going to include substation level characteristics. So to answer your question, Sandutha, um, what we do is we rank every substation in our, uh, in our data into terciles, being high, medium and low for 12 measures. So in the demographic characteristics, what we include in the model, are the proportion of people aged over 65, um, the average household size, proportion born overseas, proportion that work from home, unemployment rate, average income, uh, proportion union TAFE. I'm not going to be able to go through the results for every single um, characteristic, uh, that, but they are all in the paper and I'll just pick out the highlights. With regards to housing variables, we look at the proportion which are rentals, median house prices, residential density and proportion with rooftop solar. And in terms of climate, we look at cooling degree days, which is a basically a measure of, of, um, of heat. So how often does the temperature and to what magnitude does it exceed a, a comfortable temperature by which people um, who have AC are likely to use, to use it. So again, the, the, the definitions in the paper, but, but we rank all the substations based off basically how hot they are. Um, oops, apologies. And so our model, what's changed from the previous uh, equation is now instead of just having a beta times the number of households connecting to the substation, it's a vector beta times a vector Z. And so this, this Z contains uh, indicator variables for whether that particular substation is either high, medium or low for each of these 12 characteristics. And so what this model will allow us to do is our estimates of beta, we can kind of multiply them out by whatever characteristics we're interested in to sort of estimate the average usage for households in neighborhoods with a certain, certain, set, uh, certain selection of characteristics. So here's the kind of first set of results. And this is like what I showed in the preview, um, except for now I'm, I'm displaying the estimated profiles by average size of household in the neighborhood. And so I'll give a little more detail now. The black line is actually the estimated profile for a house, average profile for a household connecting to a substation that is middle ranked on all 12 of those characteristics. The blue line is for some a household that is in a sub, next to a substation that is highly ranked in terms of average size, but middle ranked for all other characteristics. And the red line is for a household that's connecting to a substation that is middle ranked for everything, but low ranked for size of household. And so again, this seems relatively sensible that households in areas where you have more person per household consume more energy on average. Um, and so in terms of summarizing, again, you can see all these figures in the paper, but for the presentation, I'm condensing it a little. Um, electricity use is higher across all hours a day for households in areas which have an older population, larger households, and more overseas born. So they're just some sort of descriptive things that come out of this analysis. When we look to the housing characteristics, what I'm plotting here are the estimated profiles by median house price in the neighborhood. And what's interesting is that, uh, that, um, that uh, houses connecting in areas where you have kind of wealthier uh, houses or, or at least higher valued houses tend to consume a lot less energy. And again, this may be due to the fact that, well, why are these houses expensive? potentially because they've got really great insulation and energy efficiency properties. Um, it may also be the unfortunate thing that the, the big beautiful houses or, or, or sorry, the expensive houses uh, aren't occupied as much because their occupants may be more likely to be at work or something like that. Um, so we see that electricity use is higher across all hours a day for households in areas with more rental properties and lower house prices. That's what kind of comes out again, in, in, in our analysis. And just one point I wanna raise is that there's not actually monotonicity with respect to a lot of these characteristics, which I didn't mention. So for example, on the left-hand side here, we see that average consumption is actually 
highest for middle income substation you know, areas and lower for both high and low income areas. And that may be because, you know, as I was alluding to, well, if you're low income, you may just be more likely to cons conserve energy because um, it's a big part of your bill and uh, of, of, your, um, of your living expenses. And if you're a high income, perhaps you're less likely to be home. Um, so middle income actually, for instance, seems to be the higher uh, energy use areas. And, and interesting with solar, uh, middle solar penetration happens to be the highest um, uh, average uh, electricity consumption. And again, uh, I just want to emphasize, this is not sort of a causal model, it's a descriptive model. We see that, um, you know, on average, uh, areas which have high amounts of rooftop solar penetration have lower energy use, um, but, but, you know, it's not saying how much less energy you would use if you put solar on your roof. That's not what this exercise is doing. So now we're going to get to, I guess, the main point of the paper, which is estimating the wholesale spot procurement costs. And that's going to use what we've just uh, estimated as, as part of the process. So to estimate procurement cost profiles, the base model looks very similar to what we just saw. We're just changing the left-hand side by the procurement costs at substation S and time T. Uh, and again, running that as a function of the number of houses and the number of businesses connecting uh, to that substation. So that's kind of going to give us the, 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 the procurement cost if you're paying spot. Uh, the socialized procurement cost uh, is, is what we're going to assume. Well, how we're going to do this is we're going to um, multiply the usage profiles we just saw by a fixed price that would socialize all network, uh, sorry, all wholesale expenditures among households. So we're going to kind of compare two different regimes. One where it's like, okay, imagine everyone was paying spot and another one which says, okay, let's imagine everybody's paying a frat price, which would allow retailers to recover uh, their wholesale expenditures over the whole year. And so what we what we see here are those two series so so the business profile here remember the blue line looks exactly like the other chart i showed earlier and that's because it's just multiplied by constant it's multiplied by that socialized price the red line is the average wholesale procurement cost taking into account that, that the wholesale price goes up and down throughout the year similarly for households so I might just focus on the households here in the interest of time. Um, but you can kind of see, well, well, the y-axis here is the average procurement cost in dollars. So it sort of says on average, a household uh, under this socialized price is paying around two cents every half hour up to, you know, throughout the day and then up to about three cents at the evening peak. But if they were to be paying wholesale spot prices, well, then on average, they'd be paying less than one cent overnight and close to one cent in the middle of the day but nearly six cents in the evening. And so this again is just demonstrating the cross subsidization inherent uh, to having a socialized price as opposed to having people face spot prices. Um, but yes, early evening, of course, is the most heavily cross subsidized under fixed price plans on average. So what we're gonna do with these sort of procurement cost estimates, these are basically in cents, they're in dollars and we've got uh, electricity use profiles, which are in kilowatt, uh, or we can convert them to kilowatt hours, we're going to construct a wholesale cost per kilowatt hours, uh, per kilowatt hour, I should say, for households in areas uh, which have specific characteristics uh, from our earlier estimates. And so mathematically, what we're doing, we're saying for a given Z, so for a different, for a given set of characteristics, um, you know, demographic and housing characteristics, let's sum up the average daily across the whole day um, uh, procurement costs and divide that by uh, the total number of kilowatt hours you would usually use over a day to get your estimated wholesale uh, procurement cost. And so um, I'm just going to focus on the, on the kind of uh, uh, on a few of these characteristics, but what we kind of uh, see here is, so I'll just focus on the top line. The socialized price we estimate under that kind of um, definition is 10.42 cents per kilowatt hour. And, and so what we estimate from our model is that 
a household that connects to a substation that is ranked medium and on all 12 of our characteristics, uh, on average would pay 10.4 uh, cents per kilowatt hour. But if we were to have a household, or, you know, households connected to a substation, which has fewer pensioners, but is medium in every other characteristic, they consume uh, or their average um, wholesale procurement price is about 0.3 of a cent higher. It's 10.71 and it's 10.18 for areas that have many or more uh, elderly citizens. So what this is kind of saying is that the procurement cost is lower for areas that service the elderly relative to those that, that, that service uh, younger populations. Similar to that, we see that areas with lots uh, more, um, or, sorry, less rented properties, so more owner occupiers, have a higher wholesale procurement cost or are more expensive to service uh, relative to those that live in high rental areas. And in terms of house prices, the, those which have lower house property values tend to be cheaper to service than those that have high property values. Um, and so to summarize, the neighborhood characteristics that are associated with lower wholesale procurement costs per kilowatt hour appear to be tied to characteristics we usually say uh, define the more vulnerable. So more elderly, more rentals and cheaper houses tend to have lower wholesale procurement costs. And so in some sense, it kind of is saying these are folks who are more likely to wait their consumption in the middle of the day when electricity, wholesale electricity prices are low and the, you know, kind of the opposite of this group, so perhaps the, the people who live in wealthier houses, uh, uh, sorry, higher value houses um, who, who, who own it themselves and perhaps are younger, they're probably more likely to be in the office from nine to five and have a higher weight of their energy consumption at that evening peak when they get home and, uh, and, and so there you go. I didn't describe this in the, pre, in the table, but it also might be more rural, so it looks like uh, air, lower residential densities and, and hotter weather is also tied to lower wholesale procurement costs per kilowatt hour. And so, you know, this leads us to kind of say that if there are cross subsidies from fixed rate electricity tariffs, on average, these are funded by groups we would consider more vulnerable with recipients uh, being those that we usually consider more affluent. So I'm gonna quickly get through the discussion and of course open it up to questions. Um, uh, I'll address Tim's questions in the, at the end. I, I think we'll just get through the discussion, but um, please feel free to, to, to keep typing and then we'll, we'll get to them in a moment. So, um, so first of all, let's relate this back to real-time pricing or you know, having spot exposed uh, households. What, what have we learned from this analysis? Well, first, the distribution considerations is what we really inform. And at the observed levels of consumption, it appears that more vulnerable groups would pay less under real time pricing than fixed rate pricing. So this again, we're gonna caveat it in a moment, but it's possible that this could have pro-social uh, pro redistributive uh, properties. And the big caveat of course, is that real time pricing would substantially change your risk profile. Uh, and of course the attention costs you need to kind of put into monitoring electricity prices. And I think some people may be familiar with what's going on in Texas at the moment. Uh, there are these gritty customers who, who actually have full uh, real-time pricing um, uh, plans who are getting eye-wateringly high bills in the sort of thousands of dollars for a week um, during these blackouts and scarce conditions. And so, um, you know, the, the analysis we've just done, as I kind of say, is at observed levels of co uh, consumption, who would pay more or less? Um, but, but it's not kind of making a statement as to the, the, the value of the risk you'd be taking on to do so. Um, and of course, these are on average, these are broad population segments. So there's certain to be household specific winners and losers, um, which, which we of course can't speak to because we're using such aggregated data at the, um, at the substation level. Regarding efficiency considerations, there's obviously a clear economic argument for, for, for the benefits of real-time pricing, or at least why it might be beneficial when you kind of take out the risk element. And that's because you would incentivize consumptions when the cost of generation is low and de-incentivize consumption when the cost of generation are high. Um, and so what this kind of 
our analysis suggests is that if you were to introduce real-time pricing, um, you know, I'm not saying this is a, a feasible sort of everybody all of a sudden just magically goes on to real-time pricing. Well, it would, it would re result in more affluent households facing higher prices on average. Um, and I guess one question to ask is, well, are these the households that would be best equipped to install smart appliances and offer automated demand flexibility since they often are more energy efficient to start with? So it's kind of, would be pushing on higher incentive for, for perhaps those who are more able to be flexible to actually offer a little bit of flexibility in their, in their usage. And so this is a strictly optimistic interpretation of the results. Um, you know, you could say that jurisdictions with fixed socialized electricity prices may be able to both improve economic efficiency and redistribute payment shares away from more vulnerable pricing populations with uh, real-time pricing now with all the appropriate caveats. That, that's kind of, we want to get the ball rolling on this discussion uh, rather than making a big, uh, a big claim. But our, our data can obviously speak to uh, some broad population groups uh, being at least lower cost to service uh, than, than others. The final uh, piece I, I, I want to just uh, discuss is how is this cross subsidization ch uh, been changing over time uh, in line with renewable penetration. And so in 2014, if we looked at the average procurement cost at socialized prices, this blue line, it tracks pretty closely the average procurement cost at spot prices, by and large. We still had a fair bit of rooftop solar in 2014 for, for what it's worth. And then what we see in 2016 is that these start to depart quite a bit overnight, and particularly at the evening peak and a little at the morning peak. Middle of the day, they're still pretty close on average. And then this is the figure I showed earlier, yeah, you know, in 2018, where we've we've pretty much tripled uh, rooftop solar in in, in four years, uh, we're starting to see you know quite big departures in wholesale procurement costs in the middle of the day and the end of the day relative to these sort of uh, to a socialized price. And so this kind of raises the question, you know, could renewable penetration basically be reinforcing both the efficiency and pro-social distribution outcomes uh, and properties from having real time electricity pricing. So to wrap up and, and, and get into the discussion, um, you know, fixed rate retail electricity pricing entails implicit cross subsidies. And as I've just said, the magnitudes are increasing in recent years, coincident with renewable penetration. And what we've done in this paper is we've developed a method to tease out these cross subsidies to some extent. Um, to, to our international viewers, this can be applied anywhere where you have census data high frequency substation data and wholesale uh, cost data. You don't need smart meters to apply this, this, this uh, method we've, we've um, performed. And so in 2018, Victoria, we find that uh, the characteristics of groups associated with being net funders of the subsidy being areas with low house prices, more renters and more elderly residents. And we, rate, we, we you know, interpret the results, raise the possibility that real-time price plan offerings can have positive pro-efficiency and pro-social distributional outcomes. So, um, and just to return to a few of the caveats I've mentioned, there's, there's a bunch of further work here. As, as I said, we're just getting the ball rolling. This is a first peak as to who consumes when and, and, and how expensive is that energy. But obviously studying the risk preferences, attention costs, automation costs, uh, of, of these key groups could be quite informative to see whether it's real-time pricing is something that uh, has a chance to actually be a desirable product uh, for, for some of these groups. And finally, uh, there's a huge amount of work I'm sure that could be done regarding uh, consumer protection and hedging uh, measures. And, and as I said, you saw in, in, in Texas, there are some, some people who are just getting eye-watering bills um, and, and you've got to, it's very much worth asking, did they know what they were signing up for? And, and, and are we happy to just leave this to, um, to the market to provide products such as this without providing, um, uh, you know, perhaps regulated protections, uh, uh, price caps or, or, or some sort of um, um, exposure cap, I should say, uh, to, to these products. So, that, so there's a lot of further work that could be done in this space. Um, and so that's a wrap. Um, this used to be the, 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 the conclusion slide of, of my presentations last year, where it's my own smart meter data uh, across seasons, where you can kind of see we feel the cold in winter. Um, but but, but I'll, I'll open it up to, to questions. And so uh, please feel free to, I think, raise your hand and otherwise 
I'll take a moment to, to take a drink and then go through the questions that are in the chat. Right, thanks Gordon. So um, have a quick drink if you need it. Uh, I believe there are a few questions already in the Q&A box. So uh, a few have been addressed uh, in, in writing, but uh, I believe there's a few more that you can probably uh, respond to in the next few minutes. Sure, so, so Tim, Tim Ryan, have you only had net meter data from the smart meters? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so with solar, household, the actual consumption would be obscured, yeah. So, so Tim, I mean, it was even more granular than that at substation level. Um, so so um, I wish we had smart meter data. That would have been fantastic for this because that was part of why we needed the modeling framework that kind of counted the number of businesses and the number of households because we kind of just see the aggregate number. Um, so this is definitely a net uh, profile we are backing out. Um, and yeah, so, so and, and to his follow-up question, we only look at the wholesale price we are. We, we, we're not looking at the true procurement costs for retailers who may enter forward contracts. We're really, uh, it's the exercise we're performing is assuming you were procuring all energy at spot. So spot on, yeah, um, good question, but that's the exercise we were doing. And it's more, I mean, that's all that was feasible, right? Um, we kind of, we're kind of making the most of what data is available to us to gain some insights uh, to, to this, to this um, uh, um, problem. So um, you've been busy, Tim, let's see. <laughs> uh, the finding LMI would pay less than real-time pricing is close to earth shattering. LMI, uh, maybe if you, is it, does anyone know? I'm, I'm guessing it's the, the group, the, the, the household group. So I appreciate the comment. Um, uh, okay, David, have you, why do we constrain the study to Vic? As you say, you don't need the smart meter data yet. Um, it was basically that David, no, no real reason. Um, I guess for one, um, we should acknowledge that uh, that Armin is a is a postdoc um, who we have here for one year, um, and and I guess uh, under the funding arrangements, we wanted to produce something that was relevant to the city of Melbourne, um, and we of course could expand it. So this was more a first pass, a bit of a proof of concept. Um, but you, you, you're dead right. We could apply this anywhere. Um, and, uh, and then I've got to say, the, the data efforts of Armin to organise this were, were mammoth. It was quite a lot of work um, because they come in different formats. And, um, and so I guess once we had enough to kind of to start, we, we just started. Um, and, and on that note, I'll give a very quick uh, plug for our wonderful postdoc Armin. Um, who, who's, who's with us for one year, but if, if anybody else out there is after a postdoc, uh, please, please, please uh, send us a message. We, of course, uh, we, we love Armin very much and would uh, would love to see him land in a happy place after after his time here. Um, um, okay, uh, Greg, uh, if, if the spot and socialised prices are diverging in total over time, the final slide, do you imagine there are increasing variations locationally as well? Yeah, so um, I think that obviously this stylistic pattern, we see a lot in areas with rooftop solar or, or any solar penetration, that in the middle of the day, uh, prices become quite low and at the end of the day, they become quite high and quite quickly. Um, and, and to your point, uh, Greg, absolutely, to the extent that, um, that you know, some jurisdictions have much more solar relative to others, but also the kind of the demand for energy differs across the day as well, you know, related to the, to the climate of the area. This is a much more relevant problem, I would say, or, or phenomenon, I should say, uh, in Australia than it would be in, I don't know, Singapore, where you have much flatter kind of um, load curves. So, so absolutely, I, I'd imagine increasing variations locationally and even within Australia. Um, uh, oh yeah, Tim, I see your comment, low to medium income. Got it. Um, okay, the, the, the bottom of the list now I see is a question from Andrew Rendell. Uh, if there is asymmetric uptake of real-time pricing by 
socioeconomic characteristics. For example, affluent households move to real-time pricing, but vulnerable households do not. What are the expected outcomes across the dimensions you have studied? Have you seen this happening with, within some of the substation areas studied? So really good point, Andrew. I'll, um, I'll return, uh, I, I didn't actually see, because I know Guillaume answered the question, but someone was asking about the car analogy, which I'm always nervous to kind of, well, I, was, I don't know why I started bringing it up, because it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it, it can be instructive. What you described might be a little bit like an insurance market unraveling, uh, but this is in massive numbers, negligible numbers. This is all academic. Um, and so you could imagine that, um, suppose that everybody has the same insurance product just, uh, regardless of your risk. And then one day insurers are allowed to discriminate based off age and, and young drivers are more likely to crash and older drivers are less likely to crash. So they have a higher premium and, and the others have a lower premium. You could see something like that where those who could benefit more from real-time pricing, and remember these are the ones who, who potentially can move their consumption to low price times a day. So by providing you know, some economic value here, um, well, as they do that, they're all of a sudden not in the pool cross subsidizing everybody else. Um, and so you would expect that if there is positive selection, I guess on real-time pricing, that, that it would raise, I guess, the, um, the, the price for everybody else. Um, and, and, and that's the sort of thing which may happen, you know, and in the car insurance analogy, it's like, well, all of a sudden the, the premiums are gonna raise for those who are the riskier kind of drivers. Um, so, so, so yeah, we, we, we can't really speak to that. Um, oh, the questions disappeared. Oh, there we are, it's up the top. We, we can't really speak to that within our data. I mean, we're in 2018, so, um, you know, even today, there's, there's next to no real-time penetration. I mean, there's a very tiny amount um, real-time pricing penetration in our retail markets. Um, so I think this is a, uh, I think this is a very relevant question, um, but it is uh, perhaps in years to come, not, 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 well, maybe even decades. Um, feel, feel free, Andrew, to follow up if, I, if I've missed the point there. Um, Yes, and and one, one thing I guess uh, while there is a bit of a gap and, and we've still got a few people logged on, I, I kind of didn't discuss it in, in, in the talk, but real-time pricing, I understand there is sometimes there is quite a, um, a bit of fear surrounding it, um, that, that of course the, the, the less sophisticated people might get stuck. Uh, and, and, uh, and unhappily kind of be on the wrong end of a few bill shocks. Um, so that's why I kind of say there's a, there's a heck of a lot to be done on uh, research on this topic. But in some ways, I, I actually view it as inevitable if we're going to see uh, in, in some form, if we're going to see the kind of, say, electric car penetration that some optimistic kind of projections are, are moving forward, right? But if we are all kind of, in the drive EVs one day and we all get home and we plug it in at the exact same time, I mean, well, we're not going to be able to serve the load. Um, and so how do you communicate? Well, you can charge at six and you can charge at 6.30. Well, I guess you could have a centralized planner, but that's just not going to fly, I would say. You, you're probably going to want to communicate this via prices and algorithms that, that, that have these kind of appliances um, uh, automatically charging in a least cost manner, say, where you just say, oh, I don't care when it gets charged. I just want to make sure at 6 a.m. when I leave for work, I've got a full tank of, a full, I was about to say a full tank of gas, but you know what I mean, a full, full tank of, of, uh, of energy. Um, and so to that extent at the moment, yeah, you, you would expect that um, yeah, the early adopters of EVs perhaps tend to be more affluent. Uh, and so they may end up being the, the, the first people who move to real-time pricing if we end up requiring something along these lines to, to solve this coordination problem um, with, with, with people, you know, uh, plugging in. I see some more questions have jumped on um, uh, and I have not been ticking them off. And so I don't actually, I don't get them in chronological order, which is a little annoying. Uh, Ron, okay, I haven't answered one from Ron. Were some household characteristics more or less Significant statistically speaking, yeah. So, so Ron, great question. Um, I, I'd just say that our estimates of load, these ones, basically these profiles, are, are 
are all very precise. We've just got a lot of data. The exercise we do at the end, we actually don't have standard errors for, and 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 that's because we, um, I guess, it, it's yeah, it's not ideal, but it's sort of the best we could do at the moment. Which we 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 um, take basically the estimates from one model, which was the procurement cost model, and divide it by the um, by the by the um, estimates for for the energy use model. So. Um, so yes, the, these are very much point estimates, and, and you're right. They, they, we, we I, I actually can't speak to the precision of them, um, but what I would, um, and that probably is something that we need to do in the next version of the paper. Um, but I would just say that we do have a lot of data, right? We've got hundreds of substations, and and well, we've got half hourly observations, right? So so um, so where are I? So basically, in the very simple model, you can kind of see we have quite tight. Uh, estimates of consumption. Um, okay, uh, anonymous. Major issue with RTP is that there is there is only partial take up and people self select for it. The cross subsidization for the non RTP customers will get will just get worse. I mean, uh, to that extent, I mean, if if, if the real time the people who move to real time pricing. Are lower cost to service. Well, you know, uh, those who are left on, to some extent, some people may say should be paying more, right? Because they are consuming it more at higher uh, cost times a day relative to those that have switched. Um, but, but, you know, I, I take your point. Um, uh, Dean Yarrell, observation you're already able to do the EV charging decision in price signals. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of, of machine learning charging devices that use the spot price history. Yeah, and, and you say clearly requires you to have TOU price signal. And so Dean, I, 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 great, I, I, I'm not surprised that retailers want you to, um, to, to, to basically, yeah, well, there's a demand for this product. I'd say uh, uh, distinguish between TOU and real-time pricing though. I, I think what you really would want is, is from, from a you know, planner perspective is real-time pricing because TOU of course, uh, could have, uh, for, for those who, who aren't familiar with it, it is sort of like a fixed price based off the time of day, not necessarily based off the current wholesale price conditions. And so, again, if it's like, okay, we've ticked over to 10 p.m. at night, my rate changes, uh, then you'd just, again, you'd have this big discontinuity uh, where, where you maybe would have a whole bunch of folks who just, oh, well, we'll set it to charge at 10. Um, you, you do sort of want a, a healthy kind of distribution of prices. Uh, based off real-time spot conditions. Um, and perhaps I might answer what I think is the last one. And please um, raise your hand if I've missed your question and, and it's particularly pertinent. The last one I see is Tim Ryan. There are ways with real-time pricing that have subscription type elements where you have brought your forward, yeah, you, okay, you have bought your forward, your forecast load, ideally at forward prices. And then you face marginal prices when you deviate. So, so spot on, Tim. That that's the ideal, I think, from a um, you know from a pointy-headed uh, economist point of view, is to say, okay, let's all kind of buy a buy a load profile in contract form in advance. And so I know if I consume less than that, I'm going to get paid money at the spot price. And if I consume more than that, I um, am exposed. You know, I have to pay wholesale spot prices. And so that's obviously a hedging product. And it gives you some certainty as to how much you can use uh, safely, I guess, um, if, if you are wary of, of getting caught in a wholesale spike. Um, that's it. All right. Well, thank you, Gordon. I think uh, we may be uh, out of question. We're certainly out of time. And uh, if there's one thing that I've learned uh, in academia is that uh, you can never go over time. So I'm going to bring this to a close. Thank you very much again, Gordon. Thank you for to our audience for uh, attending today and uh, asking so many questions. Our next talk will be next week on the 2nd of March. We have Frank Wallach uh, addressing us. If you haven't received any uh, information about this, please feel free to email any of us. So either Gordon, myself, or Nancy, who is uh, sitting in the background somewhere, or perform a search on the Monash website. The information is definitely there. Thank you very much again, and we'll see you uh, hopefully next week again. Goodbye. Thank you.
Thanks, everybody.